I hope you won't be angry with me if we talk about anger today. <laughs> if so, well, you've come to the right place because we're going to hopefully get some good tips this morning about that. So let me start with a testimony of something God did in my own life regarding anger. I just want to give God credit for this. Uh, I'm 14 years old, and I'm sitting in my Catholic 8th grade classroom when the priest comes in the door and signals for me. And I'm looking around going, is he, is he asking me? I, I wasn't one to get in trouble a lot. I thought, I guess he means me. So I went to the uh, door in the classroom, and he said, you need to go home immediately. And I'm thinking, why is my mom sending me home in the middle of the school day? This is really weird. So I walked home. I'll never forget the moment at the top of the uh, steps. My mom greets me with these words, Skip is gone. Skip, a nickname for my dad, gone meaning he's dead. He'd had a, a sudden heart attack at work and, and had died. First words out of my mouth, God will take care of us. I remember meaning that. There was a sincerity in that. But that's not what I stayed with. After time, I was so angry and, and grief-stricken over my father's death that I decided I would be an atheist. And that lasted for a number of years. And I was very angry. In fact, I had a, a friend, a female friend in high school that said she was afraid of me because she could see the anger in my face. Now, I tried to release it in several ways. Uh, people told me, take a bat to a tree, uh, which I did, or, or scream into a pillow, all these ways of releasing it. And that never worked for me. It just stirred it up, it seemed to me. It didn't get to the root of it. But a couple years later, not a couple years later, after I received Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord, I looked up one day and I said, you know what? I'm not carrying that anger around anymore. The reason? Because I had a purpose for living. And I had a new father, <laughs> a heavenly father, who replaced the things I'd lost with my dad. And so it's a beautiful thing, and I could say 2 Corinthians 5, 17 was true in my life. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Don't we serve a good, good father? And a father to the fatherless, and I've experienced that. So I'm so grateful. So I am Ed Skipper, and uh, my ministry is Heart of Revival, Proclaiming God's Word, and supporting spiritual leaders. So I speak in different churches. I've been in about 80-some different churches over the last 13 years, and I sow into the lives primarily of pastors. Uh, I also minister at Teen Challenge and do some street ministry at skate parks and uh, LBCC at times. My wife is a nurse. Uh, I've got three grown daughters and six grandchildren, and we live in Lebanon. So with the, it's been a rough few years, hasn't it? A rough couple of years. Uh, not only do we have the pandemic, which was huge for all of us. Uh, you know, we've got this war in Ukraine. We had a divisive election. And you've got personal stuff going on in your life that has probably made you angry. I'm going to assume that's the case. So I'm going to ask you, which of these things has made you angry in the past? Typical things that happened to all of us. Having to wait a long time. For someone or something. People doubting what you say. Being yelled at. Someone cutting in line in front of you. Someone uh, or something wasting your time. You feeling that you're being used. Wrongfully accused. Being lied to. Being unjustly punished. Getting stuck in a traffic jam or something the government does that you think is unfair. So here are five ways that we can deal with anger and we will go into each of these more. Number one, we can suppress it, stuff it down, deny it. Number two, we can let it rip. We can give full expression to our anger. Number three, we can be passively aggressive with our anger. 
None of those are good, as you probably know. Number four, we can be assertive. And number five, we can give it to God. We can surrender it or drop it. So as we look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. Now the beautiful thing about the book of Ephesians and other books that Paul has written is that it begins with who God is, who Christ is, what Jesus has done, who we are in Christ. And that with that foundation then comes the part in chapters 4 to 6. This then is how you ought to live. And you've got to have both those pieces. You got to have who we are in Christ and what He's done. So it's not just a, a to do thing. Christianity is not a set of rules. But on the other hand, there are duties and obligations because we are such a privileged people. And so we are in that part uh, of Ephesians here in chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. He's talking about how we should live. Here we go. I want you to notice the three commands that the apostle gives, Paul gives, as he quotes Psalm 4. Watch for the three commands. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Did you hear the three commands that he wrote? In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. In your anger, do not sin. Now, I've made an observation about people, including myself, that we tend to fall into one category or another by, by nature. I'm talking about maybe apart from what the Spirit of God has done in us. By nature, we tend to be, I think, imploders when it comes to anger or exploders when it comes to anger. Imploders are people who stuff it down, deny it, hope, it, hope it's not there, and, and just try not to deal with it because it's not comfortable. Exploders are people who give full expression to their anger. Both of those things are not healthy. Imploders pay a price with their health, and they pay a price themselves as they end up maybe resentful or bitter. Exploders pay a price with their health, and they pay a price in their relationships. So I'm just, what, can we do a quick survey here today? I think it would be fun if you're willing to tell us by a show of hands here in a moment which category you think you fit more. You might say, well, I implode, 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 then I explode. But just pick one if you can, if you think you're more of an imploder or an exploder. So how many of you would say that you're more of an imploder? Let's see hands. All right. How many of you would say that you're more of an exploder? Let's see hands. Looks like the imploders outnumbered the exploders a little bit there. I fit in the imploder category, no question about it. When I was pastoring in Springfield, there was a police officer in our congregation, and we got in a conversation about yellow lights. You know, when a green light turns yellow and then it turns red in an intersection, and he asked me, what does a yellow light mean? And I knew that it meant caution. And he said, well, is it being cautious when a driver steps on the gas to make it through the intersection before it turns red? No. He said, I give tickets for that. I didn't know that. Now, I wasn't doing that. <laughs> But uh, I just found that interesting. I didn't think, oh, okay, you're right. That's not very cautious. I want, you, I want to say that anger is like a yellow light. Slow down. Be cautious. There's a danger. Anger is dangerous. In your anger, do not sin. Okay? Don't ignore it like a yellow light. And don't speed ahead. That's how we should treat anger. In your anger, do not sin. So anger in itself is not the sin here. He's assuming that you'll be angry. In your anger, do not sin. It's dangerous. It can easily lead to sin. Even righteous anger. Even when you're angry at things you ought to be angry about. Is dangerous. 
Doesn't mean we shouldn't have it. It just means you need to see it as a yellow light and be cautious because it can lead to sin. Now, I learned early in my life that anger is not okay. That's kind of what I was taught by example. And uh, when my dad died, I hated the anger that I felt, and I just didn't want it to be there. And, and as a Christian, I thought, oh, this is not very good. I shouldn't be angry. I'm a Christian. I want to be this perfect person. And so through all of those things, I learned to stuff my anger. You know what stuffing anger is like? How many of you have been in a swimming pool and taken a ball, an inflated ball, like we did as kids, and tried to hold it down to the bottom of the pool? The ball is trying to come up. It takes a lot of energy to hold that ball under, and when you let go, it just goes boom, and it goes shooting right out of the water because it wants to come out. And so suppressing anger doesn't work. Just to, just to want it to go away because you don't like it doesn't mean it disappears. It's there and it has an effect. I've started to feel my anger and tell myself now in recent years, it's okay to be angry. It's human to be angry. Don't fear it. Don't be afraid of it. Recognize it. Oh, that's anger. Sometimes it's taken me days to realize that I'm angry. Sometimes I'm stewing over something two, three days later and go, I must be angry about that. So I've gotten better in the last few years at recognizing anger. In your anger, do not sin. In your anger, do not sin, the Apostle Paul says. Um, I want to... So that, that's stuffing it right that's suppressing it we've talked a little bit about suppressing it let's talk more about giving full expression to anger anger's dangerous uh, i pastored in when i was pastoring in springfield the last uh, few months that we were there you might remember the thurston shooting at thurston high school in uh, 19 uh, must have been 98 in may of 98 kip kinkle a student at Thurston, on a Wednesday night, shot his parents. They both died. They were both teachers in the school district. The next morning, he went to the high school cafeteria and started shooting up students. Two died. One was as good as dead, and many were injured. And it was a terrible time. My, the principal's family was part of our church, and it was just a horrible time. A horrible time for the whole state of Oregon, the whole nation for that matter. But Kip Kinko wrote this just to illustrate that anger is dangerous. In your anger, do not sin. He wrote this in, a, in his journal before this incident. I am so full of rage that I feel I could snap at any moment. I think about it every day, blowing the school up or just taking the easy way out, walk into a pep assembly with guns. In either case, people that are breathing will stop breathing. That is how I will repay all of you for all you've put me through. There's one kid above all others that I want to kill. I want nothing more than to put a hole in his head. But they won't laugh, he says, after they're scraping parts of their parents, sisters, brothers, and friends from the wall of my hate. I don't want to hear, see, hear, speak, or feel evil, but I can't help it. I am evil. I want to kill and give pain without a cost, and there is no such thing. So important. This, I know this is an extreme example, but it really illustrates how anger is dangerous when we, when we let it brew and simmer and, and, and feed it by thinking about it and increasing that anger, harboring, harboring it and stewing about it. So expressing anger aggressively. Listen to Proverbs 29.11. Proverbs 29, 11, fools give full vent to their anger, but the wise bring calm in the end. Fools give full vent to their anger. 
It wasn't too long ago in May we were commemorating Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980. Some people will say, when I'm angry, I let it out and then it's all over with and everything is better. Kind of like the eruption of 1980. There were no more major eruptions, at least, after the big one. But look at the destruction that it left in its wake. And that's what it's like when you give full vent to your anger. It leaves destruction in its wake. It does damage to our relationships. So don't think of anger or rage as something you have a right to or something that you're pushed to beyond your control. God always provides a way out. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, we can believe this about any temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. So as you are seeing yourself moving towards giving full vent to your anger, you can say to yourself, God always provides a way out. What, and you can be asking yourself, what is the way out that God is providing me so that I don't give full vent to my anger? You can live by faith in that way, believing there is a way out and asking yourself what that is as you go through that process of dealing with your anger. You can also learn from yourself what your triggers are, and what your thought processes are, so that in the future, you can change those. Notice what James says about anger over in James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. So how do we become slow to anger? Are you interested in that? God is slow to anger, it says many times in Scripture. I want to be slow to anger. How do we get there? Well, one thing we can do is we can develop a heart that cares about what God cares about. Where my passion My motivation is to honor Jesus Christ, to honor God, that that's what I'm about. Just like what we sung about earlier, that worship is all about Him, that I make my life all about Him. And the more I make my life all about Him, the more my anger changes. Different things make me angry, not so much the selfish things anymore, as we develop a heart that wants to honor God, and that's the main goal of our life, it changes what we become angry about. And we do become slow to anger. Another thing I think of when it comes to asking the question, how can I become slow to anger, is this. I need to remember that I often don't have the facts in a situation. I only know so much. So I want to tell myself, let's be slow to come to judgments because there may be more facts that I've not learned yet. So let's take our time before we come to a conclusion. How many of you have watched a crime show like 48 Hours Investigates and you're watching and you go, that guy is guilty. Maybe they're showing the court case and the prosecution is presenting their case or the program is presenting the case against the guy and you're, that guy is guilty. And then the defense comes on and you go, oh, maybe not. They got some good points there. But if all you did was listen to the prosecution, you'd be sure that they were guilty. 
And so it is in, in, in life, if we just get one side of a story, we're going to conclude that that is the true side and the only true side. I learned this early on in my ministry. We had a, a man come to us who was having marriage difficulties. His wife had separated from him, and he just poured out all his woes on us. And, and I remember thinking, man, she's just doing a terrible thing, leaving him like this. And then I learned later the other side of the story. And there were all kinds of things he had not told us that were very disturbing. And I said to myself at that time, I don't want to do this again. I don't want to come to a conclusion again after only hearing one side of the story. Particularly when you're dealing with couples. So slow to anger. Proverbs 18, 17. I love this. In a lawsuit, the first to speak seems right. Until someone comes forward and cross-examines. So let's be careful. Let's be slow to judgment. In your anger, do not sin. Third unhealthy way. We've talked about suppressing anger. Talked about giving full expression to anger. And here's a third unhealthy way. And that is to be passive-aggressive. Which of these have you had done to you? Oh, better yet, which of these have you done to other people? Isn't it true that we recognize what's been done to us that's wrong quicker than we recognize that what we've done to other people? We see that plank in our brother's eye and we want to remove it. When we, or I mean, the speck in our brother's eye and want to remove it when we have a plank in our own eye. And so, so may the Lord show us if we're doing any of these things. So here we are, we're talking about passive-aggressive. Have you ever given someone the silent treatment? That's passive aggressive. Have you ever uh, not said no to something that you don't want to do? Maybe your loved one asks you to do something and you don't want to do it, but you don't have the guts to say no. You just don't do it. How about dishing out sarcastic humor? Uh, Passive-aggressive. How about complaining behind someone's back about them, but acting like your best buddies when you're with them? How about giving in to a request such as go to a restaurant that you really don't like, but you don't say anything? You just complain the whole time. And this is uh, hopefully... This uh, example will not be offensive to you. I found it quite funny. A man was out with his wife, and he was expressing to her as they were out eating dinner, Honey, I just can't believe how patient you are when, when, when I have my temper tantrums. I just can't believe it. How do you do that? She says, I just go and clean the toilet. <laughs> what does she use? His toothbrush. So there's the ultimate passive-aggressive. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. The Apostle Paul continues in Ephesians 4, 26 and 7, 27. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. In other words, deal with your anger. Take care of it. Don't just let it carry on. Don't let it carry into the next day. And do not give the devil a foothold. Do not give the devil a foothold. I want you to think of a rock climber. Unfortunately, I'm thinking of this example of this University of Oregon football player who died recently at Triangle Lake climbing a cliff. Rock, rock climbers are looking for a spot to put their foot and their arms, their hands, as they climb the rocks. They're looking for a nice hold to put their foot in. And the devil is looking for a hold in your life. And what, when does he get a hold in your life? When you don't deal with your anger in a healthy way. So don't give the devil a foothold. 
Paul writes, he, he will quickly seize the opportunity of changing anger into the nursing of anger and unforgiveness and a grudge. Anger can easily degenerate into hatred and resentment. And all of these are giving the devil a foothold. As I was struggling to forgive someone years ago, I, re I was reading a book. I was in a park. The par I was in Lincoln City on a vacation. And the funny thing is, I was at Devil's Lake. <laughs> I didn't realize it till later how ironic it was. I read this quote from this book, and the Lord spoke to my heart and said, basically, this is what you're doing, Ed. This is from Frederick Buhner. Of the seven deadly sins, anger is possibly the most fun. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come, to savor to the last toothsome morsel both the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back. In many ways, it is a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback is that what you are wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. So I don't know about you, but I don't have a lot of extra energy every day. And when I'm bitter and resentful towards people, it sucks my energy away. I believe God's grace is sufficient for me day to day, but not when my energy is being sucked away into bitterness. And when we are bitter, we are thinking of ourselves as an unfortunate victim. Kind of like saying, you ruined my life. But the truth is, God is at work making us a better person if we'll walk by faith through anything we experience. And for me, that's a reason not to be bitter. Because I can say, God, you are developing me into Christ-likeness. And this is a good thing, even if evil was done to me. All right. A healthy way to deal with anger is to be assertive. That is to state your needs in a simple and direct fashion in a way that's considerate and gentle towards those around you. Don't we all need, isn't this a great skill to learn? To be able to just say, this is what I want, this is what I need, but to do it with consideration and gentleness. Now, now, if you are uh, prone to explode, there might be times when you're angry that you just can't do this right now. You need a break. You need some time to settle down because it won't come out as gentle and considerate, uh, right? So there are, you know yourself if that's the case. It might be that you have to, I need to give it a little, give it a few minutes or an hour or whatever to, Settle down so I can stay, say this in a way that's not going to cause a fight. There are times when, whether I like it or not, I have to go to people and work things out. I have to face the fact that I'm hurt and I need to talk to the person who hurt me not in a way where I accuse them, but in a way where I own my own feelings. I was sitting in a meeting with some fellow pastors, and I realized the leader of the meeting that, that I had a, um, I'd been hurt by this person, and it bothered me and distracted me during the meeting thinking about it. And what I should have done was I should have said, hey, um, can we stay a few minutes afterwards and talk? But because I am a hater of conflict, I resisted the idea. And I went ahead and went home. But on my drive home, and we live in different cities, I realized this is tearing me up. I am really disturbed by this. 
I'm hurt. Uh, and, it's an, and it's a past hurt. It, wasn't, it didn't happen that day. And I realized I have got to call this person and talk. So uh, calling was the second best option. In person would have been better, but calling, since we're in different towns, was better than nothing. I called and I, and I expressed what I was carrying. And he said, thank you so much for sharing that. I'm going to learn from this and become hopefully better so I don't repeat this in the, in the, in the uh, future towards other people and, and maybe towards me. He handled it very, very graciously, and I was grateful. It was a reminder to me, conflict in relationships are normal. They're healthy. They can improve the relationship. Working through conflict actually can make your relationship better. So for those of us who hate conflict, best not to run from it, as scary as it is to actually face it head on. Of course, what we don't want to do is take it to everybody but the person who, we, who is the source of it and uh, ruin their reputation in the process. Another thing we can do besides being assertive and stating our needs in a way that's considerate is to take it to God, uh, to drop it, to turn it over to the Lord. Now, sometimes I don't know if I can take it to the Lord and that will be enough, or if I need to talk to somebody and work out my thing. Because those of us who hate conflict sometimes will say, well, I just won't face it, I'll just take it to God. Well, I know that's not working when, it's, when it goes on and on, and I'm still disturbed about it. I've tried to hand it over and surrender it to the Lord, I'm still disturbed about it. To me, that's a sign I need to talk to the person. Okay? But there are many times when the answer simply is, to surrender our anger to the Lord. One example in my own life, in one of the churches that I, pa I pastored, two churches, and in one of them I got a call about the salary package and all the details of that several months before I arrived. And they said that they pick up the Social Security uh, they're the employer and the employee part of the Social Security. I said, that's, that's great. And so then, when I got there, it wasn't true. They had changed their policy, and no one had told me. And I, I was offended, okay? Um, but I got to thinking about it. I know how churches operate. And I, I had to figure, you know what? There's probably nothing personal here. They're just trying. The church had monetary problems, they had to make a decision to cut expenses, and no one forgot to tell me that that would affect me. Um, and I said to the Lord, I said, God, I'm just going to drop this. I'm not going to bring it up, I'm not going to confront or anything. I'm just going to drop it. I'm going to give it to you. And you know what worked? It just like, it was never an issue again for me. It didn't carry us intensity. So isn't it, isn't it good to know we can just take our stuff to God? <laughs> And give it to him. What a good, good father. Amen? <laughs> All right. Let me close with a couple of illustrations. These are from the news. Going back to June of 2021. You might have heard this in the news. There was an accident in Utah. Where a car hit a semi-truck. And the driver of the car was a nine-year-old girl. And the passenger in the car was her four-year-old sister. Very early in the morning. The nine-year-old got the bright idea that she and her sister would drive from Utah to California in the family car. She got her sister up. Apparently her four-year-old sister thought it was a good idea too. Or maybe she just submitted to her older sister. I don't know what happened. But she got her up in the night. And they got in the car and headed for California. And uh, not surprisingly, they got in an accident. The accident was not that serious, fortunately. The police called the parents who thought their children were in bed. <laughs> they didn't even know they were gone, let alone they, there'd been an accident in their car. Someone has said this about anger. Anger is like a child. You don't want it driving the car, nor do you want it stuffed in the trunk. Which brings me to the second 
news illustration. January of this year, a mother was charged by authorities because she had her 13-year-old boy stuffed in the trunk when she went for COVID testing because he apparently tested positive at home. And now she's at the drive-up testing site with her 13-year-old son in the trunk, and she got arrested. Again, anger is like a child. You don't want it driving the car, nor do you want to stuff it in the trunk. So in your anger, as Paul says once again, in your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Lord, we confess that anger can be hard to deal with. And we affirm that, yes, it's dangerous and it can lead to sin. Help us. Those of us who tend to implode, help us to recognize and accept our anger and not pretend that it's not there when we have it. For those of us who tend to explode, teach us, empower us not to give full vent to our anger. For those of us who tend towards Passive aggressiveness. Let us see it and recognize it when we're doing that and, and stop it. We don't want to handle our anger in that unhealthy way. Do give us the courage to speak to people we need to speak to, to be assertive, stating our needs in a gentle way. And Lord, help us to turn it over to you, and that's what needs to happen, just to release it and surrender it to you. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Now, if any of you want prayer regarding anger, maybe you were stirred up this morning, um, I'd love to pray for you, and I know there's a group here that would love to come and pray for you. So at the close of the service, if you want to come up, please do. And we'd love to pray with you because we all need prayer and support from our brothers and sisters. Uh, if you are interested in a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you are interested in eternal life, in what it means that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead in your life, we would love to talk to you about that as well. So feel free to come at the close of the service for prayer in that way. And finally, if you're interested in my ministry and particularly my teaching and preaching. I've got several devotionals, over 200 devotionals online and sermons online. Um, may God's healing grace and his power be evident as you deal with anger in your life.